I am Bill Cortright with Living Right with Bill Cortright. And this is the Stress Mastery Podcast, where we take you from the science to the spirituality of stress mastery. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Stress Mastery Podcast. I am Bill Cortright and I'm here with the bus, super millennial David Barreto. How you doing, bus? that because I take people to school? That's it, because you school <laughs> everybody. This week, we have been focused on surrender, and today we are continuing the book study of Edgy Conversations by Dan Waldschmidt. This episode and the Weekend to Break Free event this February 16th, 17th, and 18th in Minnesota is being brought to you by Touchpoint Solution, the device that buzzes stress away. For more information, contact them at www.touchpointsolution.com and type in the word stress master for a significant discount. Yep, Minnesota. Gotta wear a Vikings jersey if they win the Super Bowl. What the hell was I thinking? I think you'll Um, be okay. You think you'll be okay? You think so, Dan? They look pretty damn good. (laughs) I hate to say that, but they really do. So Dan opens this section of the book titled Discipline of Denying. This is a really good section. Most of us are willing, and this is Dan speaking, most of us are willing to do almost anything in order to really realize our goals. We will turn over any stone, cross any bridge, scale a, any metamorphical uh, mountain. <laughs> we'll scale any mountain, okay? In order to achieve success, or at least that is what we say. We are quick to talk about how disciplined we are, how on point and energized we are. But success often has less to do with what we are willing to do than what we are willing to do without. We tend to think of discipline as a series of tasks that must be done, that we must and need to complete in order to achieve success. But the doing part is only one side of discipline. The harder, grittier side of discipline is what you won't do. Discipline is as much about denying as it is about doing. You agree with that? Oh, absolutely. It's That's huge. The- it's about not going to the movies tonight because we have to record. It's about you know skipping out on this because we have to work. So Dan continues, it takes guts to say no to yourself. Our brain is not wired to help us with this discipline. Of all the massive computing power in our brain, only one little portion is wired to help you deny yourself. Just one part of the brain controls inhibition to stop from doing things that would derail your path. This part of the brain is also highly moody. (laughs) It's a highly moody section. In other words, too much caffeine, it gets jumpy. Too little sleep, or if you have not eaten, it slows down. And if you've been drinking, it turns off completely. So the discipline of denying is very, very interesting because as Dan says, it's the only part of the brain stopping you from immediate gratification. Now, this is me speaking. See, each time you give in to putting off an important task, like putting things off to tomorrow, or you're skipping your weekly budget focus, or you're not following your diet, you're overspending on your your um, your expenditures, that one cookie turns into a dozen cookies, putting off an important phone call, each time this happens, you actually weaken your discipline. You weaken it. If you do, you know who said that? Zig Ziglar. Zig Ziglar said he took up exercise. And so he got up every morning at five o'clock to run. And so what happened was, he said, I had, an, I had a, I didn't get home till like one in the morning because I was traveling that. And part of me said, you know what? I'm not going to get up at 5 a.m. I, I, I just got home at one. But he kept, got, he changed that and got up at five still because he knew that it was better to take a nap later in the day than to, to lose the, the discipline and break the routine. That's why I train at the same time every day, even with a little sleep, because what that does is it keeps me in that discipline mode. And that's what Dan's talking about here. So Dan continues, as a society, we have become 
addicted to immediate gratification. And this addiction to immediate gratification is killing your dream. Discussions about addiction usually are focused on personal vices, right? Gambling, alcohol, drugs, pornography, but no one discusses the addiction that's robbing us of our true potential. We are addicted to fear. I love this, by the way, because he's right. We are addicted to making excuses. We are addicted to passive, aggressive behavior. We are addicted to selfishness. We are addicted to listening to the crowd. We are addicted to TV. We are addicted to the safety of a paycheck. That's a good one, right? People get addicted to the paycheck. They get into that corporate world. They give them a, a, a 3% increase and it's like they keep on keeping on. Yeah, your raise is two cents. Like, oh yeah. Yes, yeah, I'm moving oh forward. God. Or they give you just enough raise where you go out and buy something you have to keep working for them so you can keep paying for what you just bought with the raise. You know, that's the problem. So we are addicted to comfort. I totally agree. And we are addicted to the easy way out. Then, then states, how about being addicted to greatness? And we come into our story. So I'm going to get that eye fixed. I can read this damn thing. <laughs> All right. Here's the story. You guys ready? Mike Weaver took up boxing in the swamps of Vietnam in 1970. Not yet 20 years old. The young Marine found training deeply inspiring and threw himself into it with fierce passion. After Vietnam, he moved to California where he trained to the point of exhaustion, but his results were lackluster at best. Rather than sulking about why he wasn't reaping rewards of his efforts, he denied himself the luxury of giving up. It would have been easier to quit, to concede that he would likely never achieve the dream of becoming a boxing legend. Instead, he pushed himself harder. And it didn't go unnoticed. He became the favorite sparring partner of Muhammad Ali. Although he lacked finesse, his chiseled physique and incredible strength tested the abilities of more talented boxers against whom he sparred. That's what he seemed to be good at making other boxers better. No one believed in him or his dream to be a champion. For the next half decade, Weaver languished in obscurity and the punching bag of more capable superstars. He blew every lucky break he got, losing six of his first dozen fights. But the experts agreed that he was starting to show promise. Despite his lack of skills... He was able to last longer in each subsequent fight, sometimes just barely losing in the final rounds. Mike realized that he would have to achieve his dream the hard way. He would have to work even harder to get what he wanted. He stayed disciplined, he stayed focused, and that commitment was about to pay off. Cool story, right? Yeah. So there's a sidebar that he didn't put in there, so I'll tell you in a second. On March 3rd, 1980, Mike Weaver walked into Stokely Athletic Center in Knoxville, Tennessee, to fight the undefeated John Tate for the WBA Heavyweight Champion. Quite the opposite of Weaver, Tate was a boxing phenom. Initially a star amateur boxer who fought in the 1976 Olympics, Tate had quickly amassed a 20-0 record as a professional. In sensational form, he had captured the heavyweight title from Jerry Cotez of South Africa in front of 100,000 of Cotez's fans. Tate was electrifying, charismatic, and the fans adored him. The fight against Weaver was nothing more than another stepping stone for Tate, another notch in his belt. Tate immediately went to work on Weaver. Fighting 25 pounds heavier than Weaver, he moved effortlessly through, the, effortlessly through the first 10 rounds, smashing Weaver with wicked jabs and brutal right hooks. Weaver had never finished a 15-round fight before. Wow. He had always finished his fights much earlier, and the fatigue was evident. As the bell for round 15 sounded, Tate glided around the ring minutes away from victory. But Weaver pressed the fight, knowing his only chance to win was a knockout. He picked up the tempo. He was desperate. 
Sometimes desperate's good, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, right? It kind of gets you into going. A corner. Yeah. After a decade of getting his head punched in, he was fighting in the title match, and he wasn't going to go away quietly. His arms felt like rubber, but he kept swinging. The announcer ringside noted, Weaver seemed to fight harder in the 15th round than he did in the 5th round. With only 40 seconds left in the match, Weaver hit John Tate with a left hook that knocked him out cold. It was the right punch at the right time. It was the punch that had been practiced for 10 years. And it left Tate unconscious on the canvas for minutes. I saw that fight, by the way. Against all odds, Mike Weaver became the heavyweight champion of the world and one of the greatest boxing inspirations of all time. For 10 years, Weaver denied himself immediate gratification. Listen to this, David. For 10 years, he was a sparring partner. A bunch right? of professional punch, bunch of bags. Yes, for 10 years, Weaver denied himself immediate gratification, immediate glory, immediate rewards, immediate recognition. When no one else believed in him, he kept going. He stayed disciplined. Well, here's another part of that story. I'm getting better at reading these damn stories. You know that, right? Uh, here's another part of that story. Um, this was the inspiration. One of, one, of the, one of the inspirations for Rocky, you know, when Rocky was working, when Rocky was working on um, his scripts and everything, right? So these are these are some of the things that, that people don't know that this guy. I remember the fight. I remember it, and it was like, remember Wide World of Sports? Mm -hmm. It was a Wide World of Sports. It was like, there ain't no way this guy, this guy would not quit. And I want you to imagine. You saw all the things that Dan said we're addicted to, and it's really important to look at that. We're addicted to fear. Why are we addicted to fear? It keeps us from having to change. It keeps us in the cage, exactly. We are addicted to making excuses. Why are we addicted to making excuses? Because that way it's better to say, well, you know, I didn't have the money or I don't have the, you know, I don't... I, I don't have the time. I don't <laughs> have the time, you know, excuses. Because it's better to say then we're, we're a coward. We're afraid to step out. We're addicted to passive aggression. In other words, we're addicted to bitching. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Complaining. We're addicted to selfishness. It's about us. And so... I'm going to tell you, would you agree with this statement? You cannot become successful by yourself. Oh, no. It's around you who you team. surround yourself with. So look at the teams that we're building and the people that we're working with. When you're addicted to selfishness, it's got to be you, and it's all about you. You're never going to find success. It's impossible. And so that's what Dan is saying. We are addicted to listening to the crowd. How many times have we been told we can't do what? That's my whole career, though, Dave. I've been told I couldn't do something since the day I started. You can't do that. You can't build. Nobody's going to pay you for personal training in Miami. Nobody's going to do that. Yeah, I'm starting to hear yeah. that can't do this, can't yeah, do I, that now. No one's, like, gonna, ah. no one's going to listen to you to build wellness in Panama. You're not even a doctor. You don't speak Spanish. Oh, yeah? Look at that. No one's going to let you come in and build wellness within a regular primary care clinic, right? And no one, there's no way you guys can shift the world. Just wait. Just watch. <laughs> Just watch. So that's what happens. People get addicted to listening to the crowd. And we know the things that were addicted to TV, but I like this one. We are addicted to the safety a paycheck provides. You know, it's okay to have a job, especially when you're like, you know, like I, I look at um, Kevin. Kevin works hard, and that's my son-in-law, your brother-in-law. He works very hard because he needs to provide for a family, a young family of two children, and his wife is going to school, finishing her nursing degree. This guy is not doing what he loves to do, and, but he's not addicted to that paycheck. You know what he's doing? He's already started personal development. He's already taking courses and certifications that he wants to do. He's already planning to move out. But I know he's got to work. And it's okay to have a job. But if you're not living your dream because you're afraid to step away from the job, that's a problem. Yeah, his situation is different, especially because he's doing exactly what we talked about in the beginning of this episode. He's making a sacrifice that doesn't provide instant yes. gratification 
but in the long run pays off bigger than he can imagine. Yes, it allows their family to prosper. And meanwhile, while he works his butt off, Mm -hmm. he is building his personal development. He doesn't make any excuses. Nope. No, and that's a perfect example. There's no excuse. He's not going to wait until Angie gets her degree and starts working. No, no, no. He's doing it now. He is getting up and working out at 3.30 in the morning. He is in the climber community. He is taking courses. He is going to join the group coaching. He's investing himself now. Oh, no, we gave him a compliment. <laughs> yeah, I know. I should have done it. Every time I give him a compliment, he'll do something and piss me off. But anyways, one of the things that Dan says also is we're addicted to comfort. And I totally agree with that. Everybody wants to be comfortable. The See, zone this is the difference. Cage. A teacher, a good teacher in the Western world, because I got to work in the Philippines, right? So it was kind of cool. A good teacher in the Western world is about making you comfortable and understanding the subject that's taught. Makes sense, right? Mm-hmm. A good teacher in the East is about making you so damn uncomfortable and scaring the crap out of you and getting you to step outside your comfort zone. Wow, what a difference. The te- they, they actually push you. We coddle you. Yeah, just think about how we teach <laughs> to like kids to swim, throw them in a the pool and see what happens. They throw them That's, in a the yeah, pool. They, they really do it. They'll dunk you. <laughs> they will do it. So... Dan closes this section in, in, in that story. The story of Mike Weaver is awesome. So Dan closes this section. How long could you keep going if you were not going to get the breaks you thought you deserved? Could you deny yourself immediate gratification for 10 years if you could have your dream? What's your answer to that? Um, I think, well, it's kind of unfair for me to answer just because everything I'm doing now is five years out. But so let's I'm say, already but saying, let's say we work five years and you don't, and it doesn't move, and it doesn't move, doesn't move, doesn't, and then I'll say, ten years from now, it's the number one show, and we're making millions of dollars, and Oprah saying, please, can you guys come on our show? I think it's it's what you talk about. <laughs> yeah. If you have volition, it doesn't matter what the time frame Thank is. You. When no, it, it happens, doesn't. it happens. Because you don't know what you love, you know. It's lo- and coaching is I love coaching. Don't get me wrong. But it makes me sad sometimes when I hear people have spent their life doing something because they needed to pay the bills. Mm-hmm. And we pay our bills, but we get to do what we love. Yeah. And it is, sometimes it's hard work. Mm-hmm. It really is, but it doesn't matter. So I, my answer is I could, I don't know what, I don't understand what my dream is. I don't know. I, I, I'm living it. So I'm kind of like you. So, but the answer, the question is, could you out there deny yourself immediate gratification for 10 years if you could have your dream. So Dan closes it up. Rise up and muster the courage to deny yourself. Say no to limiting behaviors. Say no to having the need to look right all the time. Say no to immediate gratification. This is a big one. Say no to playing victim. Here's one. Say no to being lazy. (laughs) You know? And finally, he closes this with, say no to the easy way out. There so, is no easy way there, out. It's just, it's just a, there's not easy, hard, it's just the way, right? So we talked about it this week. Next week, he's going to talk about discipline starts with a plan, which is going to be perfect because we're going to be talking about breaking free next week. But we talked about it. So it's always a definition. When we said fake it to make it, I really do. If, you, if your goal is to be a millionaire, You've got to walk, talk, act, think, be a millionaire. Now, when you're a millionaire and you're working on stuff that does not work, a so-called failure, millionaires look at that as if, ah, that didn't work, let me change directions and move this. Somebody who has a lock program could be doing the same thing and they will tether the failure to themselves. Oh, I failed at this. When I hear people say, I failed at anything, no, if motivational speakers, that's a badge of honor. I fail. I never failed. By the way, I don't ever fail because I have a definition of failure. If I do my best and it doesn't work, it's not a failure. I always add one more piece and I learn something. That's my definition of failure. So for me to fail, I have to half-ass it, which you know I'm not going to do, right? <laughs> and I have to learn nothing. 
Yeah, or not do it. Yeah, not see, that's not, well, that's attempt. never yeah, going to happen. Know, and, and, yeah. and it's funny because I, I just had a coaching where I was explaining that there is no failure, there is no success. There are always opportunities, whether it happened and it was a learning experience or it happened because you were ready for that opportunity. Man, listen to you. That's true, though, because if you always say, well, I'm a success, like, do you stop? Yeah, what happens Are you then? done? It's an opportunity Is it to over? move forward. Is it gone? Or if it wasn't ready right? for that time. Right? There's yep. definitions, and it's always about the ego. See, we have the success has to have this, this, this. Is, no. Mm-hmm. Success is, I did what I needed to do today. I'm getting ready here to finish this and shut the hell up and off because uh-huh. it's been one of those days, right? Successful day. Mm-hmm. I'm still here. I get to wake up. Maybe I'll get to wake up to do it tomorrow. Hopefully. Yeah, that's what I always say because yeah. like tomorrow is an opportunity. Like for right now, it's success is always tethered to being good. Yep. And failure is always tethered to being, being bad. bad. So just, if you put an opportunity, it's just neutral. It it's is. good. Look at you. You can You're write really that one down. It. Put that on a t-shirt. I want a t-shirt. We got a lot of t-shirts <laughs> going on. That's it for today's show. Our mission here at the Stress Mastery Podcast is to create a shift in the planet. Even though they say we can't do it, David, you can still try it. And join us by simply like, share, and subscribe. The links are right below. As always, until next time, stay inspired. inspired.